Hey, welcome back to part three of my What Exactly Is A Container mini-series. Now, in this video, we will be focusing on building container images. But just before we start, I wanna take a step back and kind of set the scene for this video and the remaining two. Uh, on the screen now, you can see the environment that we're gonna be working with. It's nothing earth shattering. We've just got a few hosts and a container registry. So basically the bottom left hand side of the diagram is my Mac and then we've also got another server labeled a build server. Those are the machines that we'll be using in this video to build our container images. After that we're going to look at pushing those container images up to a registry. So that's for our next video. And then finally in the last video of the series we'll look at pulling the images down from the container registry and running them on the production host. Now it really seems simple and that's because it mostly is. But of course we're gonna make sure that whenever we get the chance, we're gonna go behind the scenes with the technology and really understand what's happening with examples. All right, let's get to it. Let's start building container images. So we wanna build a container, right? But I just spent what, like a minute saying container images in that intro. So what exactly is a container or more pertinent to this video, a container image? Let me start by saying that unfortunately the word container is a bit of a conflated term. I think at a very high level, it can be defined in two ways, depending on whether what you are referring to is running or not. When the container is not running, it is really just a packaging format for an application. On the file system, it's basically just a tar file that contains other tars and some accompanying metadata. This package is actually called a container image. For example, if someone asked you if you've based your app on the latest Ubuntu container, what they probably mean is, have you used the latest Ubuntu container image as the base OS for your app? If you don't fully understand this statement, don't worry, you will by the end of the video. But for now, just consider how convenient container images can be when you no longer need to support platform specific images like RPM, DEB, JAR, or any other weird random proprietary image format for a specific file type. The code in OCI compliant images should behave the same way no matter where it's run. They really open up that build once, run anywhere mentality. Now, a container is a running instance of a container image. A container basically manifests itself as a lightweight, independent machine running on a host. However, when you really look into it, and we will over the next few videos, it's really just a resource restricted, isolated process running on a host. Now, before we get into building a container image, I wanna talk quickly about Docker. So for many, the term Docker is synonymous with container. This really shouldn't be the case. So a super brief history lesson before we get back into the tech might help clear this up. Docker didn't actually create containers. Many of the core tools to do so already existed in the Linux kernel before Docker came to market, but what they did create was a really refined user experience that had everyone super interested in containers and a really cool logo to match. So there was significant interest all over in using containers as a standard for software delivery. As more and more companies came on board, it quickly became evident that Docker, the company, couldn't support all requirements the broader community were after. For this reason, the community started to develop their own solutions to different problems. As always, to improve compatibility and encourage innovation, a standards org was established. In this case, the Open Container Initiative. OCI was started to define standards around all things containers. And just so you know, these standards, some of which were actually donated by Docker, have led to a fantastic level of interoperability between all OCI compliant tooling today. So Docker is still alive and well, but my main point here is that Docker, whilst instrumental to the popularity of containers and the user-friendly tooling around them, including the Docker protocol, Docker isn't actually the technology that makes containers possible. We'll cover specifically what those technologies are over the coming videos. Okay, so back to our workflow. We know we wanna create a container image, a way to encapsulate our app in its own environment to make it super easy to distribute and run. Now we could use industry standard OCI compliant tooling created by the community to complete the demo workflow we're after without touching Docker at all if we wanted to. However, we're still at that stage where everything isn't so easy and tooling compatibility is still kind of a challenge. For example, Podman and Builder, two open source OCI compliant tools that we'll soon be using on the CentOS machine to do the same things as Docker, don't actually run on Mac yet, which is kind of inconvenient. So there's nothing wrong with using Docker. Because of that, I'm going to build our demo app into a container image twice. Firstly, using Docker on my Mac, 
And secondly, using the OCI compliant container image build tool called Builder. Okay, let's get to it and take a quick look at the app that we're gonna containerize. So you've actually already seen this demo app in action in the first video of the series. It's just a simple web app that says hello world when you start it up and you can change the background color with it. I've built it using Next.js, so we can just uh, quickly start it up in dev mode and take a quick look and see it running outside of a container. So this is the app that we're going to containerize. Now we know we want an OCI compliant image so that it will work with all the other OCI compliant tooling. So what exactly does an OCI compliant image look like? Well, let's take a look. By the way, it's unlikely you'll be piecing this together yourself. That's what the build tools that support OCI spec are for, like Docker and Builder, they do that for you. But I think by looking at the output of the build tools, so basically the contents of an OCI compliant image, we get a better understanding of how containers work. So let's answer that question. What does an OCI compliant image look like? To do that, we can head to the OCI spec. So here we have all the details on the OCI image spec. If you scroll to the bottom of this page, we can see that there's this understanding the specification section. So for now, I'm gonna time travel a little. I've already built the container image using the demo app, and I have the image extracted onto the file system in an OCI format so that we can explore it now and compare it to the OCI spec. On the left of the screen, you can see that we have a blobs folder, an index.json, and an OCI layout. So if we come back to the spec page, if we click on the image layout, we can see as we scroll down the page, the image layout is as follows. We need a blobs directory, an OCI layout file, and also an index.json must exist. So that's exactly what we have here. Basically the OCI layout file represents the root of the container image uh, with the layout version as well. The index.json, if I neatly format this, actually represents the entry point to the container image. We can follow this entry point and navigate deeper into the image. So you can see here that the digest is a SHA-256 and it starts with 6B. So if we head over to blobs and we're in the SHA-256 directory as well, we can actually have a look at the file starting with 6b. So we can see that this here is also a config. I can change this to JSON. And we can now see a manifest file that's pointing to both a configuration and an array of layers. So let's first take a look at the configuration. We can see that starts with 1d. And what we can actually see is something very similar to what we would see if we did, for example, a Docker inspect on a container that we've already downloaded. So you can see the architecture, the OS, uh, we've got some environment variables here, the entry point. So we know it's a, a Next.js app. So you can see there that we start the application with Next Start. Uh, working directory, we'll cover that when we look at the build, the root file system, and all the files that make up the different layers. These here are the SHA-256 hashes of the uncompressed layers. We've also got the container history included, and that's it. Okay, so let's come back to this root FS part here, because we've got a number of files here that have not been used on the left-hand side yet. We haven't referred to them. If we click them, you can see that the editor can't even display them. This is because they're all compressed. So each one of those cannot be displayed. If we come back, we can see that the, just let me change that to JSON again. We can see that each of these actually corresponds to one of these files in the left, but the hashes on the left are the, the hash of the compressed contents, whereas the hash in this file here is the hash of the contents uncompressed. Okay, so let's uncompress one of these layers and see what the contents are for ourselves. What I'll do is I'll just create a new temp directory and then extract one of the layers directly into it. So you can see the contents are actually a file system. So let's do that again now with another of the layers. So in this particular layer, we can see the app directory and it probably makes more sense just to scroll up a little bit and you can actually see all the contents of the app directory, which is mostly just this .next folder, which is actually just the compiled code of the Hello World application. Okay, so for now we know what we need to end up with in terms of a file structure, and the build tools will help us to do that. But what we still probably don't really understand is exactly what the deal is with all these different layers of file systems that are bundled into this image. 
So this part is crucial to understanding containers. We need to go one level deeper and learn about something called a union file system. And then we can come back up and start to build the image again. So what is a union file system? It's basically a technology that allows you to combine multiple file systems together by laying them on top of each other with the higher layers in the stack superseding the lower layers. So in this example, I'll be specifically talking about the overlay file system two or the overlay two storage driver implementation, because this is pretty much the most common storage driver for container engines like Docker, Builder, Podman, and Creo. Okay, so as always, the best way to understand the technology is to start using it. So let's build our own union file system using OverlayFS. I've SSH'd into the build machine. I've got two tabs open to the same machine. I'll start by creating an overlay file system directory. We can navigate into that on both sides. Now overlay file systems work with four different directories. So I'll make those. So we can think of the base directory as the directory that will contain files that are baked into the file system. So this directory is the equivalent of the layers that we just seen in the decomposed OCI image. The overlay directory acts as the topmost layer of the file system and is effectively the only file system the container really knows about or cares about interacting with. The diff directory is where the file system will maintain its change set, where any differences between the base layer and the overlay layer will be stored. And finally, the work dir is kind of like a halfway point between the base directory and the diff directory. Um, we probably won't really see too much action happening there um, unless we did some sort of really large file operation that might take some time. Um, so once it hits the diff, the changes are always seen in the overlay and no longer in the work dir. Okay, so I'll start by copying some test files into the base directory. We can see we have three files in there now, and now we can mount the file system. So we're using dash T to specify the type of file system, dash O to supply options. Uh, we're calling the mount overlay FS, and then we've set the mount point to the overlay directory. We can see the file system is mounted, so that's all good. So now on the left-hand side of the screen, we're watching the, the overlay file system for any updates, and that'll refresh every three seconds. So let's take a look at some of the characteristics of the overlay file system. Firstly, everything that we added to the base directory immediately shows up in the overlay file system. We can see that anything newly added to the overlay directory also shows up as a diff. We can see that deleting a file effectively hides the file from view, even though it still exists at the layer the file was added in. So Van Dyke was removed from the overlay file system, but the file still exists at the base layer, and it's showing up as a diff. I've just edited a file, so we can see that the file still exists in the base. It also still obviously exists in the overlay, but we've also got an additional entry in the diff as well. So if we have a look at the contents of the overlay, we can see it has the updated contents. If we have a look at the contents of the diff, we can see it's also the updated content. And let's have a look at the content of the base as well. You can see that the original file still exists unchanged in the base directory. Okay, so hopefully that explains some of the key characteristics of a union file system, specifically overlay FS. We can unmount the file system now. So there you have it. All these file system layers are subject to the same rules that we've just seen applied to those test files in the example. So container images are really just basically a bundled file system from different sources with some associated metadata to correctly reconstruct them. Different storage or graph drivers. So in this example, we looked at overlay two, um, which is now commonly the default, but there are others like um, AUFS and device mapper. They each handle the implementation differently, but the end result is pretty much the same. The biggest difference between this example that we just went through and what a container engine does is that the container engine handles multiple base directories, which are obviously each of the layers that we see here in the blobs directory. So just to quickly summarize all this, basically new files are only ever created at the topmost layer. 
When you modify a file, it's copied to the top layer and it masks the same file from the lower layer. It doesn't actually delete it or anything like that. When you read a file, you're reading it from whatever layer the file was originally added. Deleting a file effectively hides the file from view, even though you have to remember it still exists at the layer that it was added in. So it's never truly deleted from an image. And then finally, directories are merged. Now, a quick note on persistence. We know that containers provide consistency and predictability because they are immutable. So everything we just did would be lost if a container was to restart. If a file needs to be available for the container to work as expected, it should be baked in during the build process. Otherwise, if storage is needed, for example, for a database running in the container, then an external volume should be used. But that's out of scope of this video. So you can probably start to see how union file systems are what gives containers many of their benefits. You can inherit from others. You can build off what they've already done by using their file system layers and adding your own on top. So this can really make you know things like updating and patching systems super easy too. Just swap out a layer during the build process. In terms of immutability, uh, even though it doesn't feel like it, it's only the uppermost temporary layer that's ever written to once the file system is mounted, and any changes are discarded when the container no longer exists. So no permanent changes can be made to the image without intentionally building them into the image. This significantly reduces time spent on any accidental changes that could occur, and also any environmental issues that can arise when the container image moves through different environments. Union file systems also help to reduce storage duplication. So images that have common layers share the layer and they don't actually duplicate the storage. So this results in a lot less storage used and more consistency between environments as well. In terms of startup time, union file systems make containers very fast. Each new container simply references the underlying layers. It's only the upper most temporary writable layer that needs to be created at runtime. This makes starting and stopping containers really cheap too. Things like scaling up in real time can be really snappy and responsive. All right, now this video was getting a little long, so I split it into two parts. Now that we have the fundamentals of union file systems covered, we can get started using Docker and Builder to build our Hello World app into a container image. So please join me in the next video where I'll take you through these two very different ways of building container images. Bye for now.